This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. Good morning, I'm John Trout. It's Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. Here's what's coming up on America in the Morning. Universities increasingly turning to law enforcement to get a handle on the campus protests across the country. I'm John Stolness. House Speaker Mike Johnson's gavel will be on the line next week. Mike Johnson is not capable of that job. Sagar Magani, Washington. Democrats in the Arizona Senate have enough votes to repeal a Civil War era ban on abortion. I'm Mike Hempen. United Methodists have repealed a long-standing ban on LGBTQ clergy. I'm Haya Panjwani. On Wall Street, stock started May. Nick's Yesterday, the Fed says interest rate increases aren't coming. I'm Jessica Ettinger. A major deadly overdose outbreak in one American city. It was not limited to one geographic location. I'm Clayton Neville. And a California recount two months in the making. All ahead on America in the Morning. As campus protests on the war in Gaza continue to spread, university and college leadership are beginning to turn to campus security and the police to clear out some encampments as violence in some locations begins to escalate. John Stolness has the latest. In the aftermath of the New York Police Department clearing out an administrative building and some of the encampments at Columbia University and City College Tuesday night, about 300 people were taken into custody. Columbia University faculty member Corinna Mullen called the police action horrifying. We were surrounded on all sides by hundreds of police officers. It felt like a military invasion. It was terrifying. But New York Mayor Eric Adams defending the NYPD's actions at the invitation of Columbia officials and says he sees a disturbing trend growing. There is a movement to radicalize young people and I'm not going to wait until it's done and all of a sudden acknowledge the existence of it. This is a global problem that young people are being influenced by those who are professionals at radicalizing our children. And I'm not going to allow that to happen as the mayor of the city of New York. In California, classes were canceled yesterday after violence broke out between protesters and counter protesters at UCLA Tuesday night. Some protesters carrying Israeli flags were throwing traffic cones and chairs and releasing pepper spray while pulling down the barricade that surrounded the pro-Palestinian encampment. At a news conference, this unidentified member of the pro-Palestine UCLA encampment called it a despicable act of terror, all done, they say, in front of police. For over seven hours, Zionist aggressors hurled gas canisters, sprayed pepper spray and threw fireworks and bricks into our encampment. They broke our barriers repeatedly, clearly in an attempt to kill our community. Campus safety left within minutes. External security the university hired for backup watched, filmed, and laughed on the side as the immediate danger inflicted upon us escalated. Sound courtesy of KABC. About 20 people were arrested by Northern Arizona University Police and Flagstaff after protesters refused to abide by a 10 p.m. curfew. You are now ordered to disperse, which means you need to leave this area. And 10 protesters were arrested at the University of South Florida, including a 39-year-old man with a firearm. On Capitol Hill, Republican senators condemning what they call the Little Gaza encampments. These Little Gazas are disgusting cesspools of anti-Semitic hate, full of pro-Hamas sympathizers, fanatics, and freaks. Senator Tom Cotton calling out the president to speak. When will the president himself, not his mouthpieces, condemn these hate-filled little Gazas. White House Press Secretary Karine Jean-Pierre says President Biden has spoken strongly against anti-Semitism. No president has spoken more forcefully uh, about combating anti-Semitism than this president. And that people have the right to protest peacefully. Meanwhile, some House Republican lawmakers visited George Washington University yesterday. They are summoning D.C.'s mayor and the chief of police before a congressional hearing next Wednesday over their decision not to remove encampments and protesters at that campus. I'm John Stolness. It was barely eight months ago that Kevin McCarthy was ousted as House Speaker by members of his own party, and his replacement, Mike Johnson, may face a similar fate. Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports. Georgia Republican Marjorie Taylor Greene says the GOP needs leaders who can actually do the party's work and support Donald Trump's agenda. We need leaders in the House of Representatives that are going to get this done. Not working for Hakeem Jeffries, not working for Joe Biden, 
and not going to be twisted and lulled into keep continuing the disgusting practices of Washington, D.C. Mike Johnson is not capable of that job. He has proven it over and over again. And she'll call a vote next week to oust him, forcing Republican colleagues to pick sides after Democrat leaders said they will provide the votes to save Johnson's job. Because Mike Johnson is giving them every thing they want. Democrats counter it's time to turn the page on GOP chaos and avoid the gridlock that followed Johnson predecessor Kevin McCarthy's ouster. Marjorie Taylor Greene is the star of the show. The show is called Republicans Gone Wild. It is undermining the well-being of the American people and preventing us from delivering real and meaningful results on the issues that matter. Johnson says Green's move is wrong for the party and country, and Trump has given him a nod of support. Next week, I am going to be calling this motion to vacate. Absolutely calling it. I can't wait to see Democrats go out and support a Republican speaker and have to go home to their primaries and have to run for Congress again, having supported a Republican speaker, a Christian conservative. I think that'll play well. I'm excited about it. Sagar Magani, Washington. Major Protestant denomination makes a ruling on LGBTQ clergy when America in the Morning continues after these messages. Welcome back. This is America in the Morning. We've had an active weather week. How's today shaping up? Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. The central United States has had quite a challenging week around severe weather, with many areas having significant weather events, and in some cases over multiple days. Today, there will still be a large risk for a few stronger thunderstorms through the plains from Texas and Oklahoma eastward to Louisiana into Arkansas and Mississippi, and then northward to eastern Kansas, Missouri, and even Iowa and Illinois. A few of these storms will start the day in the western portions of Texas into Oklahoma and then build eastward through the day. There is a risk for gusty winds and hail with a few storms, but the larger concern will be heavy rainfall, which could lead to some flooding, especially for areas that have already seen heavy rain. Farther north, this same system will lead to steadier rain through parts of Minnesota into Wisconsin, with several showers extending westward through the Dakotas into Montana, and a few places in the higher elevations could even see some wet snow mixing in. In the northwest, there'll be another area of low pressure, providing showers through Oregon into southern Washington and then eastward to Idaho later in the day and tonight. Some wet snow could also mix in in the southern Cascades. In the southwest, from California to Colorado and the rest of the four corner states, there will once again be plenty of sunshine, with highs mostly in the 60s and 70s in the north and 80s and 90s in the south. And then in the east, it will be another very warm day for most areas. There will be plenty of sunshine and temperatures from Alabama to Georgia and Florida, northward to Indiana and Ohio, eastward to New Jersey and southeast New York will be in the 80s and 90s, with some records likely to fall. That's the weather across America. Little Rock, Arkansas will have another round of showers and thunderstorms, some of which will produce heavy rain, high today 78. Rock Hill, South Carolina will have plenty of sunshine and a warm afternoon with a high of 87. That's the nation's weather. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. I'm John Trout. Remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. The Arizona State Senate voted to repeal a Civil War-era ban on nearly all abortions. As correspondent Mike Hempen reports, due to procedural issues, the measure temporarily remains on track to take effect in June. Arizona senators needed 16 votes to repeal the abortion ban. 14 Democrats were joined by two Republicans in voting in favor of the repeal. Democratic Governor Katie Hobbs is expected to sign it. The near total ban permits abortions only to save the patient's life and provides no exceptions for survivors of rape or incest. In a ruling last month allowing the ban to take effect, the Arizona Supreme Court suggested doctors can be prosecuted under the 1864 law. Law, which says that anyone who assists in an abortion can be sentenced to two to five years in prison. If the repeal bill is signed, abortion would be banned in Arizona after 15 weeks of pregnancy. I'm Mike Hempen. 
The United Methodists at their annual convention repealed their church's long-standing ban on LGBTQ clergy, removing a rule forbidding homosexuals from becoming ministers. Correspondent Haya Panjwani reports. Delegates from the United Methodist Church voted 692 to 51 to remove a rule forbidding, quote, self-avowed practicing homosexuals, unquote, from being ordained or appointed as ministers. The change doesn't mandate or even explicitly affirm LGBTQ clergy, but it means the church no longer forbids them. It's possible that the change will mainly apply to U.S. churches, since United Methodist bodies in other countries have the right to impose the rules for their own regions. The measure takes effect immediately upon the conclusion of the General Conference, scheduled for May 3rd. I'm Haya Panjwani. The Dow soars on news from the Fed. What Jay Powell said when America in the Morning continues after these messages. This is America in the Morning. The Business Report is sponsored by Fisher Investments. Fisher Investments takes a disciplined approach with investing, helping clients navigate volatile markets. Learn more at fisherinvestments.com. There's lots to get to in Thursday Business. Here's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. Wall Street opens this morning after a mixed start to May trading yesterday. Investors got assurance from the Fed that interest rate increases are not on the table. No cuts are coming either. The Fed left interest rates right where they are. That was enough to pop and drop the Dow. It soared of 400 points after the Fed chair said this. I think it's unlikely uh, that the next policy rate move will be a hike. I'd say it's unlikely. You ask, what would it take? You know, I think we'd need to see persuasive evidence that our policy stance is not sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation sustainably down to 2% over time. That's not that's not what we think we're seeing. Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell at the post-Fed meeting Q&A. Not long after he mentioned that, the Dow came back to earth. It finished 87 points higher yesterday. U.S. crude oil is falling back down to $77 a barrel where it was in mid-March as tensions ease in the Middle East. Google cutting hundreds of what are called core employees, moving some jobs to India and Mexico to cut costs. Viking Cruise Line, famous for European river cruising, sold stock to the public for the first time yesterday with a strong IPO. Shares of VIK rose 8% on the New York Stock Exchange. Arms are really hot for home buyers right now. Demand for adjustable rate mortgages hit the highest level of the year, nearly 8% of all applications. Arms offer lower rates. In fact, last week, a five in one arm fell to 6.6%. Arms can be fixed for up to 10 years before adjusting to the market rate. The less affordable housing becomes, the more demand we see for arms. CNBC's Diana Olick. Investors take a gamble on Caesars and, well, things didn't work out so well. Yeah, well, the house lost and they admitted it. It was a super tough quarter, even though its customers are spending and booking hotel rooms in Las Vegas. Caesars missed earnings expectations largely because of bad luck. The house just didn't win at the tables in Vegas and it hit the bottom line hard. Bad weather, Adele canceling shows, Super Bowl and March Madness games that favored betters. CEO Tom Reeg on the call called it, and I quote here, a repeated butt kicking. But he says the consumer is healthy and spending is robust. Caesar's occupancy booked at 98% through June. CNBC's Contessa Brewer. On today's watch list, it's busy. We're going to get earnings from Apple this afternoon after the closing bell. Plus, today we hear from Cigna, Amgen, ConocoPhillips, Shake Shack, Coinbase, Expedia, and DraftKings. Ford releases April vehicle sales numbers. And today is Thurby at Churchill Downs. Derby week is amping up ahead of the Kentucky Derby on Saturday. And, of course, hopes for a triple crown winner. There's CNBC's Jessica Ettinger. We'll leave the bluegrass state for Texas next and a disturbing report on a spike in opioid overdoses. We're back after these messages.
This is America in the Morning. At least nine deaths are being attributed to a spike in opioid overdoses in Texas' capital city. Correspondent Clayton Neville reports. More than 60 people required overdose treatment between Monday and Wednesday of this week in Austin, Texas. That according to first responders there who say that number is typically about two to three calls a day. Austin Police Department Assistant Chief Eric Fitzgerald says it's the worst overdose outbreak the city has seen in nearly a decade. It was not limited to one geographic location. He said the overdoses are being seen across the community. There were patients that uh, were unhoused. There were patients that were housed. Uh, there were patients that were at their workplace and there were patients that were out in public accessible spaces as well. The Travis County Medical Examiner says that all nine people who died had traces of fentanyl in their system. Some lives were saved after receiving Narcan. Two people have been questioned in the case, but no arrests have been made. It's possible that murder could be the charge. I'm Clayton Neville. It took a little longer than expected, but the recount in the California's 16th Congressional District is now complete. Democrats Evan Lowe and Joe Simatian had both tied for second place with 30,249 votes apiece. Following the recount, Lowe came out on top by 12 votes, according to the Santa Clara County Registrar of Voters. Lowe will now face Sam Licardo, who placed first in the March primary. Covering the nation and beyond, this is America in the Morning for Thursday, May 2nd, 2024. Our show produced by Jeff McKay. Production assistants Christian Matos. Our senior producer is Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. This is America in the Morning from Westwood One. I'm John Trout. Coming up this half hour. More violence in pro-Palestinian protests around the nation. Julie Walker will have that. An independent candidate in the race for the presidency, seemingly making some waves. I'm Clayton Neville. The Federal Reserve is keeping interest rates at a two-decade high. Sagar Magani, Washington. Vice President Kamala Harris criticized Florida's abortion restrictions. I'm Haya Panjwani. A middle school in Wisconsin was put on lockdown as police responded to an active shooter. I'm Sue Aller. Anti-Semitism bill passes the House. We'll have details. Ford is recalling thousands of late model Maverick small pickup trucks. I'm Rita Foley. And a beekeeper saves a baseball game. Back after these messages. Welcome back here with America in the Morning. And for at least one half of the country, we could see some record-setting temperatures today. Here's AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. In the eastern United States, it is going to be another very warm day for most. There will be plenty of sunshine and temperatures from Alabama to Georgia and Florida, northward to Indiana and Ohio, and then eastward to New Jersey and southeast New York will be in the 80s and 90s with several records likely to fall. For the rest of New York and New England, it will be a cooler day by comparison as a storm moves southeastward from Canada, producing a few showers mainly in New England. Highs here will be in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, which is still near or even above the historic historical average. The central United States has had several rounds of severe weather over the last week, and today there will still be a large risk for a few stronger thunderstorms through the plains from Texas and Oklahoma, eastward to Louisiana, into Arkansas and Mississippi, and then northward to eastern Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, and even Illinois. A few of these storms will start the day in the portions of western Texas into Oklahoma and then build eastward through the day. There is a risk for gusty winds and hail with a few storms, but the larger concern will be the heavier rainfall, which could lead to some flooding, especially in areas that have already had heavy rain. Farther north, that same system will lead to some steadier rain through parts of Minnesota into Wisconsin, through the Dakotas into Montana. A few places, especially in the higher elevations, could even see some wet snow mixing in. It is going to be a cool day overall in these areas with highs in the 40s and 50s. In the northwest, another area of low pressure will provide some showers through portions of Oregon into southern Washington and then eastward to Idaho later in the day and at night. Some wet snow could mix in in the Cascades with a few inches. And then farther south, there'll be plenty of sunshine with highs in the 60s and 70s in the north and 80s and 90s in the south. I'm AccuWeather.com meteorologist Matt Rindy. I'm John Trout. Remember to follow us wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify, Amazon, and YouTube. Just search America in the Morning in your favorite listening app. 
Anti-Israel protests continue nationwide and some are getting violent. No arrests have been made in Los Angeles where pro-Palestinian and pro-Israel groups clashed on the UCLA campus. There were more than a dozen arrests at the University of Texas in Dallas when protesters turned on police who ordered them to leave. And at the University of Arizona, police were forced to use pepper spray to disperse an unruly crowd. As correspondent Julie Walker reports, there were mass arrests at two New York City schools. The NYPD entered the campuses and removed protesters who refused to leave the area. Approximately 300 arrests were made, with preliminary charges ranged from trespass to criminal mischief to burglary. A dramatic scene at Columbia University. Police enter a second floor window at Hamilton Hall using flashbangs to clear protesters demanding the school divest from Israel business. Approximately 300 people were arrested at Columbia and City College. We are processing the arrest to distinguish between who were actual students and who were not supposed to be on the ground. And we pointed out yesterday uh, these external actors with a history of escalating situations and trying to create chaos, not to peacefully protest. Mayor Eric Adams says Columbia asked for assistance and blames outside agitators. There are those who are attempting to say, well, the majority of people may have been students. You don't have to be the majority to influence and co-op an operation. Police also moved in at City College. About 300 arrests were made overall. Meanwhile, at UCLA, counter protesters attacked a pro Palestinian encampment, says student Edgar Gomez. There were fights going on too. Like they started hitting each other with sticks, and, uh, and there were a lot of moments where there were a bunch of pepper sprays. I'm Julie Walker. Donald Trump hit the campaign trail away from his New York trial, but as he attended a rally, another person not named Biden is making waves. Independent presidential candidate Robert F. Kennedy Jr. is seemingly causing some frustration among both the Democrat and Republican candidates. Correspondent Clayton Neville files this report. RFK Jr. said when he launched his campaign that he was in the presidential race to win it and that he had no plans to drop out or simply take votes away from President Biden or former President Donald Trump. And he's holding true to that pledge as we head towards summer and he's addressing concerns that he may lead Trump to the Oval Office if he doesn't back out of the race. Now, our polling, and I think almost all the public polling, shows that President Biden does not need my help to lose to President Trump. Uh, you know, with me in the race or out of the race, he still loses. This is what our polling is showing, too. And that, you know, I can beat President Trump. He says that for those whose only issue is beating Trump. Um, then the option is for President Biden to drop out because he can't beat President Trump and, uh, and allow me to do it because I can. Kennedy hasn't held back on either Trump or Biden. He told CNN last month that President Biden directed social media companies to censor him and called that a threat to democracy. The Trump campaign, meanwhile, paying attention to recent appearances RFK Jr.'s made, more conservative outlets like Newsmax and others. In a statement, Trump's campaign said it's concerning beyond logic that there's some conservative platforms that keep giving a voice to someone that's called the NRA a terrorist group and who believes in doing away with gas-powered engines. Trump himself on the campaign trail in Michigan this week during a break from his hush money trial. He touched on a slew of issues, including the southern border. On day one of my new administration, I will seal the border, stop the invasion, and send Joe Biden's illegal aliens back home where they belong. A long road till November, where the RFK Jr. is an independent, keeping a close distance, if you will, in the rearview mirror. I'm Clayton Neville. The Federal Reserve will be holding off on interest rate cuts for now, with inflation readings coming in slightly higher than expected this year. As Washington correspondent Sagar Magani reports, the rates we pay for loans will remain at a 23-year high. The Fed had believed inflation was steadily easing, but... We've stated that we do not expect that it will be appropriate to reduce the target range for the federal funds rate until we have gained greater confidence that inflation is moving sustainably toward 2%. So far this year, the data have not given us that greater confidence. And Chair Jerome Powell says it will need greater confidence. Prices are slowing toward that goal before cutting rates. I don't know how long it'll take. I, I, you know, I can just say uh, that when we get that confidence, then, then rate cuts will be, will be in scope. 
And I don't know exactly when that will be. He says the Fed's prepared to keep the rates where they are as long as needed after just six weeks ago projecting three rate cuts this year. Readings on inflation have come in above expectations. It is likely that gaining such greater confidence will take longer than previously expected. We are prepared to maintain the current target range for the federal funds rate for as long as appropriate. Some Fed officials have speculated rates may not be high enough to curb the economy and inflation, but Powell's dismissing that. I think it's unlikely uh, that the next policy rate move will be a hike. It also downplays concerns of stagflation, a toxic mix of weak growth, high unemployment and elevated inflation. I don't see the stag or the flation, actually. <clears throat> Sagar Magani, Washington. When we return on America in the Morning, BP Harris remarks on abortion in Florida and Congress redefines anti Semitism. Those among the stories we're covering next, back after these messages. I'm John Trout. This is America in the Morning. Abortion in the form of Amendment 4 is on the ballot in Florida in November, where a ban on the procedure after six weeks is now in effect. Correspondent Haya Panjwani reports on the remarks Vice President Kamala Harris made in a visit to the Sunshine State. Florida's six-week abortion ban has taken effect, which means most abortions in the state are banned after six weeks of pregnancy. That's often before many women even know they're pregnant. And I have seen firsthand, then, that this truly is a health care crisis. Yes. Yes. And Donald Trump is the architect. Yes. And by the way, that is not a fact he hides. In fact, he brags about it. Vice President Kamala Harris spoke against the measure during a campaign rally in Jacksonville and claimed that Donald Trump would make restrictions stricter if elected. And now Trump wants us to believe he will not sign a national ban. Well, I say enough with the gaslighting. Enough with the gaslighting. The Florida Supreme Court ruled 6-1 last month to uphold the state's ban on most abortions after 15 weeks of pregnancy, which cleared the way for the six-week ban. The contrast in this election could not be more clear. Yeah. Basically, under Donald Trump, it would be fair game for women to be monitored and punished by the government, whereas Joe Biden and I have a different view. We believe the government should never come between a woman and her doctor. I'm Hayop and Juani. Saying the shooter was neutralized, police in Wisconsin were forced to open fire and kill a middle school student when they responded to a threat of an active shooter. Sue Aller has details. It all took place outside the building, and no one inside the Mount Horeb Middle School in Wisconsin was injured. Police reported to an active shooter about 11 a.m. Wednesday morning, and that's when they say they neutralized the situation. Did you say rifle is recovered with the suspect? The school district is in a small town about 20 miles west of Madison, Wisconsin, and was immediately put on lockdown. News of the incident spread quickly, and parents rushed to the school. Brittany Rodriguez spoke to Fox 6. One of my daughters are still inside of the middle school as, as we speak, but um, all we know is that there were some kids that went to shoot. Melissa Olivado also spoke to Fox 6 and said her daughter was outside the school when she heard gunshots. My other one was on the side of the school when the shots were fired and she said that all of the teachers and the children, um, they were yelling, all, telling all the kids to run to the other side of the school. The condition and age of the alleged shooter has not yet been released. I'm Sue Aller. In a bipartisan vote, the House of Representatives overwhelmingly passed a bill to expand the legal definition of anti-Semitism used to enforce anti-discrimination laws. The bill overwhelmingly passed the House by a 320 to 91 vote. Critics of the bill have attacked it as government overreach. Seventy Democrats voted against the bill, including House Judiciary Committee ranking member Jerry Nadler and about 20 Republicans, including Kentucky's Thomas Massey. If passed by the Senate and signed by President Biden, the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act would mandate that the Department of Education legally adopt the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's definition of anti-Semitism when enforcing anti-discrimination rules. 
Well, shifting gears on America in the morning, there's another big auto recall. Correspondent Rita Foley tells us why. Ford says it doesn't have any reports of crashes or injuries because of this, but the fact that the taillights may not light up increases the risk of a crash. Ford says the problem is a computer can mistakenly detect too much current on one or both of the tail lamps, causing them to stay dark while the trucks are being driven. You don't have to worry about the headlights, the turn signals, or brake lights. They'll still work, says Ford. The recall covers some pickups from model years 2022 through 2024. Dealers will fix this at no cost to you. Notification letters will start going out in late May. I'm Rita Foley. In-game ads are nothing new, but this massive online gaming platform has started placing video billboards targeted at Gen Z. Chuck Palm has that in today's tech news. The very active gaming website Roblox with 72 million daily active users, most who would fall into the category of Gen Z, will soon be seeing virtual billboards in their revenue sharing gaming platform. Roblox announced Wednesday that their virtual billboards with video advertisements would be available in its latest move to draw revenue from games that are mostly free to play. Gamers could now see billboards featuring brands such as Elf Beauty and Walmart as well as Warner Brothers Discovery, just as they would in real life. The ads will only be seen by users 13 years or older, and it's part of an effort to reduce reliance on their in-game currency called Robux that users can use to buy outfits, vehicles, and other features inside the company's digital worlds. VP Stephanie Latham of Global Brand Partnerships said, by advertising on Roblox, brands can create deeper connections and engage tens of millions of Gen Z users. Tell us what you think at allthetoptech.tech. I'm Chuck Palm. Ready with the Thursday Sports Report, here's America in the Morning's Robert Workman. NBA, the Celtics finished off the Heat 118-84 to win their first-round Eastern playoff series in five games. 25 points each for Derek White and Jalen Brown. Maybe a little payback for last year's loss to Miami. It's all business. You know, just keep it professional. You know, it is a lot of history between back and forth, but... It didn't matter who it was. We just had to get the job done. Mavericks manhandled the Clippers 123-93 to go up 3-2 in that best of seven. Luka Doncic had 35 points. NHL, the Oilers held on for a 4-3 win over the Kings to take that first round series in the West in five games. Leon Dreisaitl scored twice in the second to put Edmonton ahead to stay. And the Stars stopped the Golden Knights 3-2 to go up 3-2 in their series. Baseball, the Twins rallied past the White Sox 10-6 for their 10th straight win. Jose Miranda had three hits and drove in a pair. You know, I've been putting in the work you know, a lot of work, obviously, before the game. So when I go to the game, I'm ready. I mean, that's, that's the main thing, you know, swing a good vision and, and, and having a plan. The Guardians nipped the Astros 3-2 in 10 innings. Stephen Kwan doubled in the go-ahead run in the top of the 10th, then made a diving catch to start a game-ending double play in the bottom half. Five shutouts. Yankees blank the Orioles 2-0. Luis Heal in the toes with a three-hit gem. A's whitewashed the Pirates 4-0. Ross Stripling in the green stripes allowed four hits. Nationals shut out the Rangers 1-0. Trevor Williams and four relievers scattered six hits. Cubs hang up the Mets 1-0. Shota Imanaga with seven scoreless innings. He's 5-0 and in his first trip to the big leagues. And the Dodgers drilled the Diamondbacks 8-0. Yoshinobu Yamamoto and friends with a seven-hitter. National League wins for the Phillies, Padres, Brewers, Braves, and Marlins. In the AL, the Royals, Red Sox, and Tigers on top. That's Thursday Sports. Thank you, Robert. And stick around. We'll have the unbelievable from Major League Baseball coming up. And no bad blood between actresses over weight loss drug remarks. Those stories next when America in the Morning continues after these messages. America in the Morning continues. There's more fallout from movie mogul Harvey Weinstein's appearance in court after his 2020 rape conviction was dismissed. Margie Zaraleta reports. One of Harvey Weinstein's accusers from his 2020 rape case was in the courtroom when he appeared before a judge. Prosecutors say she is prepared to testify again, while the other woman involved in the case is unsure, according to her attorney. She gave a very clear narrative of, of her side of the story. If you believed her, he was guilty. If you didn't believe her, he's not guilty. Weinstein's lawyer, Arthur Idala told reporters getting Weinstein out on bail is complicated, but Weinstein did not make trouble in jail. He's an older, sick, sickly man who's not a threat to anybody. The human spirit is very powerful. Harvey Weinstein was used to drinking champagne and eating caviar, and now he's at the commissary paying for potato chips and M&Ms. Um, but he keeps his chin up, and... Um, 
he makes the best out of a, a really horrible situation. Prosecutors say the New York Court of Appeals decision that dismissed the conviction means they can't use evidence used in the first trial, but they believe they have a strong case. I'm Archie Zaraleta. Actress Melissa McCarthy is responding to a comment made by actress songstress Barbara Streisand regarding an online weight loss drug. Kevin Carr has that story. Melissa McCarthy has responded to a possible online jab from Barbara Streisand. After attending the Center Theater Group Gala in Los Angeles, McCarthy posted a photo of herself on Instagram wearing a pastel green dress in honor of choreographer Matthew Bourne. In the comments section, Streisand replied, Give him my regards. Did you take Ozempic? Soon, the internet pushed back at Streisand for what appeared to be criticism for suggesting McCarthy lost weight using the popular pharmaceutical. This week, TMZ posted a video of McCarthy reacting to Streisand's comments. Do you think Barbara was out of line for what she asked? I think Barbara is a treasure and I love her. In an attempt to show no hard feelings, Streisand had posted a statement on social media Tuesday saying, quote, she looks fantastic. I just wanted to pay her a compliment. I forgot that the world is reading. Any part you can play, I can play better. Oh, I can play any part better than you. Streisand and McCarthy have worked together before, specifically on the single Anything You Can do on Streisand's album Encore. I'm Kevin Carr. Yesterday at this time, we brought you the story of bees in a bedroom wall. Today, it's bees at the baseball game. The Arizona Diamondbacks major league game against the Los Angeles Dodgers was delayed for about two hours when a swarm of bees began to gather on the protective netting behind home plate. The umpires contacted stadium management, saying the bees numbering in the thousands were a danger to both fans and players. The Diamondbacks called in Blue Sky Pest Control, who sent beekeeper Matt Hilton, who was ironically at his son's t-ball game. When he got the call, Hilton showed up and removed the bee colony, and for his efforts, while still dressed in his protective bee clothing, was asked to throw out the ceremonial first pitch. And perhaps not unbelievingly, did so to a standing ovation. America in the Morning for Thursday, May 2nd, 2024, is produced by Jeff McKay. Production assistants, Christian Matos. Our senior producer, Kevin Delaney. I'm John Trout. This is Westwood One. <laughs>